Wow. I don't know where to start. Thank you, President Burwell, for your very, very kind introduction. Provost Myers, for your overly generous recitation of uh, my career. President Burwell, your positive influence on this university and all the happy faces before us today is apparent. The future of this university is bright under your capable leadership. Congratulations. And good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this joyous occasion. <coughs> Very clearly, my first and maybe most important order of business today is to also note that today is Mother's Day and to recognize all the mothers, grandmothers, and mother figures here today who, in the spirit of motherhood, are spending a day dedicated to them, celebrating their children's accomplishments. And students, remember this when they ask you for that extra picture. <laughs> and for those, of, for those parents and families who are out there some of you still suffering from the empty nest syndrome. Not to worry. Some of these students will be coming back home to live with you again. <laughs> How long they stay is up to you. So let me begin by congratulating the class of 2019 on your extraordinary achievement. Today is your day. Your diploma is hard-earned and well-deserved. Your dedication to your undergraduate, master's, and PhD programs has culminated in today being about so much more than just a document. You are now equipped to carry forward the mantle of leadership in the coming days, months, and years. And your diploma is proof that you are qualified to make your mark in your chosen field. Let me also congratulate your families, friends, and loved ones of the audience today. Their support of your educational goals is most commendable, and they deserve your recognition and gratitude. And truly, this is a time for huge celebration, a time to cherish the moments and memories made here, and a time to prepare for the next step. It is a time to reflect. It is also a time to look ahead. In this seemingly precarious moment, it can be difficult to determine where to direct your energy and your focus from this day forward. This is not unusual. Our lives are filled with such moments where uncertainty hovers, indecision paralyzes, and yes, even fear sometimes reigns supreme. We experience such moments not only on an individual level, but also on a national and even global level from time to time. It is crucial and important to know that while these moments can be frightening, they are the times in which we grow and not the times in which we fail. This place, the School of International Service, has instilled in you the values you will need most in such moments, the ones which anchor you and the ones which will propel you forward. The philosophy is simple, but it is this. Your commitment to service to others is your bedrock, and your adaptability will be your catalyst. I have learned and relearned this at every turn in my life, and others who have spoken here before me know this to be true as well. When President Eisenhower spoke of the groundbreaking of this institution in 1957, I was living in Paris, France, my family having moved there in 1946 when I was two and a half years old. And just a year after then, General Eisenhower left Europe at the end of World War II, only a few years later, in 1950, Eisenhower became the first Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, and later on in my life, as was previously mentioned, I would have the honor of becoming the 14th in his line of succession. When my family and I lived abroad, I looked upon our country from a distance, gazing upon it from a different perspective. I couldn't have known then how important it would be to have such an experience to literally step outside one's own world and view it from another angle. But these 17 years of my life spent overseas only strengthened my love for this country and my patriotism. 
Because I had to learn about my country from others, I was immersed and educated in another culture where I soon learned that diversity of every kind, diversity of thought, diversity of race, diversity of gender identity, orientation, socioeconomic status, religion, and experience made me more adaptable as a person and more tolerant of different views. You have all experienced all of that right here on campus. The body of students represents 48 states, 130 countries, nearly 3,000 unique stories, and you're about to enter an even broader and more diverse world. Remember as you encounter new people and new thoughts that it is frequently more important to be adaptable than it is to be right. Our differences are our are asset, not our downfall. So don't be afraid to question what others tell you. At the same time, don't be afraid to learn something new, and don't be afraid to love your country. Otherwise, you can never serve it or improve it. When President John F. Kennedy gave his Strategy of Peace speech to SIS students in 1963, I was down the street at Georgetown University finishing my freshman year at the School of Foreign Service having intended to pursue a career in foreign service. At that time, the Cold War was at the forefront of our national security concerns, as was the Cuban Missile Crisis, as well as the troubling matters in a faraway country called Vietnam. These were frightening times when our leaders needed new strategies and new ways to deal with what was then a rapidly changing world. Our then President and Commander-in-Chief challenge us to be to the call of national service. During that time, in a world in which we had a clearly defined enemy and ideology, President Kennedy encouraged SIS students to view the Soviet Union with empathy, a word that has been used here already, to resist reducing a nation to its most extreme ideologies and its most extreme ideologues. Part and parcel of Kennedy's strategy for peace was an ability to look beyond the obstacles, to cut through the noise, and to remind those here that it is their sense of humanity that made them capable of greatness and which makes peace possible. Both Eisenhower and Kennedy recognized the uniqueness of this place and the people who study, the people who teach, and the people who learn here. Both contented with the Soviet threat and the uncertainty of a bipolar world, both believed in the ability of your predecessors to, as President Eisenhower put it, wage peace, to solve the problems at hand, the problems they struggled to solve themselves, and the problems they had yet to face, just like you. So I joined the assembly here in stating that all of us have the same faith in all of you here today. Not only does this school have a great student body and a great faculty, it has an impressive history of adapting its programs and curriculum to the needs of our times. In the 1960s, the International Communication Master's Program was created to foster dialogue at a time when Cold War tensions strained international relations. In the 1990s, SIS updated its curriculum to keep pace with the changes in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin War. And in this past decade, the SIS building became the first on campus to earn LEED Gold certification, while AU became the first carbon neutral university in the United States. So this shows an institutional ability to adapt to changing environments and a continued relevance to meeting the requirements of our time, and that's a very good thing. At the heart of this success and progress is this school's vigilant dedication to the concept of service, as our two speakers, our student speakers, so eloquently reminded us. Service is in the fabric of this institution and hopefully has found a place in each of your hearts and minds and aspirations for the future. As was generously reported earlier, I spent 40 years in the United States Marine Corps and two years in government. 
I was the Commandant. I was the Supreme Allied Commander. It's been my life's work to contribute to keeping America safe. In my own life, I've watched the world transform as a result of it the, to, uh, to a new generation of threat landscaping. You all know about our past, but allow me to spend a few minutes on what, we must, what you must contend with today. We live in a world where the return of autocracies is evident and the fragmentation of democracies is ever-present. The race to 5G technology, perhaps the most disruptive technology that you will see in this century, growing cybersecurity concerns, the danger of biological and chemical warfare, especially coming from non-state actors, Iran as it continues to be the number one exporter of terrorism, North Korea as it taunts the global community with nuclear testing, Russia and China, unfortunately, as near and long-term peer competitors, two examples of autocracies returning, but both smarter and more capable than ever. Energy security, where the United States is astonishingly the world leader. Space, food and water insecurity, climate change, had enough? <laughs> These challenges and many others will require your passion, your innovative ideas, your constant commitment, and your sustainable solutions. I constantly ask myself the same question you would be asking yourselves. How do we predict what happens next? And if we can't predict, how do we adapt? And if we can't adapt, how do we survive? A fair question today is whether what you've learned here prepared you for what is to come. And the answer, in my own opinion, is this. The world will change, and it will change rapidly, and it will change constantly. And it does not render what you have learned and confronted and mastered any less significant, because history has a tendency to repeat itself. It should also reinforce the most sacred of values you have learned here, and perhaps the most important key to your future success, and that's commitment to a cause greater than yourselves. That more than anything else, captures the purest nature of service. When we serve each other, when we serve our environment, we see the results. We find ourselves creating the world we want. If we don't, we risk receding from the world. We risk living our lives in silos, disconnected from reality. Something I admire about your generation is your keenness of purpose. More than any other generation I've known, yours values purpose in a career. This is admirable, and this is laudable. And this can also, at times, be overwhelming and anxiety-inducing. This is why going it alone, either as an individual or as a nation, is never a good idea, and certainly not in this day and age. So let your purpose be your service to each other. What we face next, we must face together, and we must do it for one another. Being adaptable makes us able. Being service-oriented makes us good. Some of you, when you leave today, will join the Peace Corps, which, incidentally, President Kennedy noted in his 1963 speech, and you'll travel to new places. Some of you will join Teach for America and educate students here at home. Some of you will work in service of government. Some of you will pursue another degree. Others will join nonprofit organizations. Some of you are headed to the private sector. Some of you, like I did, will join the military. And some of you, like me in 1966, do not know what your next step will be. And many of you know that your next step, what your next step will be, but it won't be your final destination. But wherever you go next, go there with empathy. Another word that has been used at this podium. Go there with passion. Go there with good intentions. Go there and become an active part of the community of things, whether you travel the world or remain right here in Washington. And do not forget that you have accomplished some of these things already by virtue of the education you have received and for which you are being honored today. You are not the person you were when you came to American University. You have learned from each other. You have influenced each other's ideas and attitudes. You've questioned. You've collaborated and created. You've joined a community. You've made it your home. 
and you made it better because you were here. Today is your chance to honor what you've achieved and to solemnly vow to yourselves that you'll do so every day from this day forward. If I may leave you with one thought today, let it be this. Uncertainty is not the enemy. Apathy certainly is. And while it's difficult to say goodbye to the places you've called home, it's important to know that this particular home will be with you wherever you go. And as a matter of fact, you will soon be contacted by someone on this stage who will ask you for contributions. <laughs> Would you like to take a bow? <laughs> so this home will be with you wherever you go. It will be a part of you. I hope that in the years ahead you'll come back to this home and help mentor the generations that will follow and to once again celebrate with your class your classmates in recalling where you were on the 10th of day, 2019, Mother's Day, and your day, and look upon your life's work with pride and satisfaction. Thank you for asking me to make, share these thoughts, and congratulations once again to the class of 2019.